statistics uh, lecture four. Let's review a bit of what we did last time. Uh, I explained that uh, variance is a measurement of how much the data is spread out. And uh, the formula for the mean and variance were explained. Uh, it looks scary, but you just have to know that sigma means you, you're adding and xi are the data values. So you add all the values and divide it by the total number of values that you have. That's exactly the formula for the mean that you've known and you've used uh, for a long time, right? Now, uh, for the variance, it's trying to measure how far each data is from the mean. So you take the difference and you take the square of it. Oh, just a minute. So let me start start over. Sorry. Sorry, I need to start start over. Yes. I I will be giving you some formula sheets, uh, but uh, it like it's not very useful. That's yeah. <laughs> it's there, but. Uh, I mean, it, it'll be in this format, but if I give you this format, would you be able to use it? Uh, you, you wouldn't, I mean, it, it'll be hard to use it, right? Yeah, so you should, if you can use it, that's good. But if you have trouble using it, then you probably have to do some example problems, right? Yes, you have. S student sex sessions, what do you mean? Tutoring. Oh, didn't you guys get an email? Yeah, that's that's all that's given at this point. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. So it, it's better to just uh, form study groups and show up uh, to my office hours. All right. So let me start over because I'm recording this. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, I forgot to turn on the video. All right. So uh, math statistics lecture four. Let's review a little bit of what we've done before. Uh, so I explained that variance measures how wide or narrow the data set is. And the formula for it is given like this. Uh, now, uh, with this, these sigmas, it looks very scary. But uh, just remember, sigma is the Greek letter for capital S, which is for sum. And it just means you add up everything here, where xi are the data values. And you know how to get a get the mean value or the average value, add up all the data values and divide it by the total number of values that you have, which is exactly what you've done when you calculate averages. Uh, and the variance uh, is in the same form. Uh, what you do is you, you take the difference between the mean value and uh, the mean value and, the, and each data, you take the difference. But you know, sometimes if you subtract, you get a negative and sometimes positive. And if you add them up, they're going to cancel, so it's no good. So that's why you take the square. Now, there is another approach where you take the absolute value, uh, which is called something else. I think it's called the meet absolute value or something. But that, that, that's less used because uh, it's hard to do mathematical analysis with it. So variance is what people use most of the time. So uh, again, uh, the purpose of squaring is to make everything positive so then that, that they don't ca cancel. And then now you divide it by the total number of things. Okay. Now, sigma in this formula, uh, sigma, this, this is a lowercase s, which is the square root of the variance, is called a standard deviation. So uh, the formula for the sigma would be you take the square root both sides. So let me see if I can. So if you take the square root, uh, I guess it's not showing for some reason. Okay, but but uh, I w I just want to say that if you take the square root both sides, you're going to end up with uh, sigma equal to the square root of the right-hand side, right? So the, the entire thing would be inside here.
Yeah, so that would be the formula for the standard deviation. But uh, rather than getting scared about the formula itself, it's just better to do some examples and, and try to see how to calculate this because it's not too bad if you actually do it, all right? Um, all right, and then uh, last time we did some examples on that one and I also explained how to use the calculator TI-84 to calculate the uh, standard deviation as well. And then I spent a lot of time la uh, in the last lecture showing that uh, when you, you're trying to calculate the uh, variance of a sample, you don't divide it by n, but you divide it by n minus 1. And I tried to explain that to you by having a Python simulation run to show that if you divide by n, it underestimates the variance. And if you divide by n minus 1, it gets a better value. So uh, that part, uh, I think a lot of you had trouble following me, but uh, uh, hopefully you were convinced that the outcome, it's not, uh, the code itself is not what's important. You just have to know that uh, if you try it, if you run simulations, you end up saying that n minus one is the very uh, better thing to divide rather than n. Okay. Now, because we are going to use uh, the sample and the population in many cases, we need to be using some notations or, or letters that easily distinguish whether the quantity that you're talking about is about the sample or if it's about the population, right? Oh, by the way, uh, starting from this slide, it's the new stuff, okay? so. Uh, until the last slide, it was just a review of what we, we went over for lecture three. Okay, so uh, broadly, what we're going to do is we are going to use uh, Roman alphabet letters for the samples, and, okay? And uh, for, for, in most cases, except the, the size of the population, in most cases, we will be using the Greek letters for the values attached to the population. Uh, now, it's very important that you, you get this concept about the sample and the population, right? Uh, you can't take a census, it's too much work. You take some sample. So uh, to make an, an inference about 1,000 people, you just take 10 random people out of that thousand, right? And you calculate their mean value, you calculate their standard deviation, and use that as an approximation of the population standard deviation and the uh, population uh, mean, right? Uh, and uh, again, we are in the business of saving money by doing this, okay? We're, we're coming up with approximations to uh, the, the real thing. And always when you have approximation, the next concern is how well does your approximation work, right? And that theory will be the entire second part of this lecture, uh, uh, th this uh, course. So statistics uh, in, in our course, it's devised of three parts. Uh, and end of each part, we will have an exam, right? Uh, actually, we don't have a lot left for uh, this part one, but after part one, we will be talking more about how well our approximation works, okay? So that's why we need uh, these dual systems. So small n is the size of sample, capital N is the size of population, so when you're given these with small n or capital N, you should immediately recognize which one you're talking about. So uh, if, if, if the question says, uh, uh, given small n equals to 10, uh, find the mean value and the standard deviation and so on and so on, then, then you would immediately know that this small n means the size of the sample. Okay? The, the bar notation on top it is often the, the symbol for the mean. So, uh, you know, when you have multiple different types of data, which we will do in part three of the uh, this course, where we have like uh, one uh, set 
one one data about the, the weight and the other data would be of height, then uh, we would put the height as x and then the mean of the height will be x bar, then the weight will be y and the mean of the, the uh, y would be denoted as y bar. Okay, so if you have multiple kinds of data, then uh, this bar on top means the mean. Okay, so that's, that's why you have this. Uh, mu is the Greek letter M, mean for the population. S, of course, is the standard deviation of the sample. I wrote capsule S because that's how your TI-84 calculator writes the standard deviation of the sample, but in the textbook, and the textbook that we're using and also in many other books, they use this lowercase s for the standard deviation of the sample. So uh, I'll be going back and forth between the, the capital S and lowercase s. Uh, hopefully that's not gonna confuse you. And as I said, lowercase sigma is Greek letter S and it's standard deviation of the population. All right. Okay. Uh, now let's do an exercise here. Uh, suppose lottery tickets of various values are sold, given in the table below, find the mean and the standard deviation. Okay. So I guess how many lottery tickets are there? Like 34. So uh, it's like a raffle. Uh, you come in and they sell you the raffle for a certain amount of dollars and they tell you that, oh, uh, like more than a third will have a prize and uh, you later find out that uh, 20 of them have zero. That means you don't win anything. 10 of them have $5 on it. 20, 20, uh, three of them have $20 and one lucky winner gets to go home with $100. So in, in this data, think of these as data. Uh, and the question is find the mean and standard deviation. Okay, so first you would have to calculate the total number of tickets, right? So you add 20 plus 10 plus three plus one and you get 34. So there are a total of 34 tickets. And then you have to add up all the values because we are trying to find the, val the, the, the mean and the standard deviation of the values. Oh, by the way, it is a, a little confusing here uh, because there are two, two set of numbers here. Some of you might think that uh, when I say mean and standard deviation, you might be tempted to find the mean value of 20, 10, 3, and 1, but that's not part of the data. Uh, you should really think of this data like this. You have zero repeated 20 times, five repeated how many times? 10 times, and then 20 repeated three times and 100 repeated only once, okay? And if you have that data set, of course, it makes sense to find the average, right? You do zero plus zero plus zero 20 times, plus five plus five plus 10 times, and then 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 100. That's how you're gonna do, do the thing, calculate. And then you divide that by what? What do you divide again? 34, because there are a total of 34 number of tickets, right? And that will give you the average prize money per ticket, okay? Does it make sense, right? Okay, so that's that's what we're gonna do. First, uh, uh, we're gonna add up all the total dollars, which is, uh, instead of writing zero plus zero plus uh, 20 times, it's a lot easier to say zero times 20, don't you think, right? And then instead of writing five plus five plus five, 10 times, just write five times 10, plus 20 times three, plus 100 times one. If you, you uh, calculate this with your calculator, you get $210. And now what do we do to find the mean? Divide the 210 by 34 and you get 6.18 something something, okay? So it's $6.18. So the average prize money is uh, $6.18. So, so imagine that uh, this this raffle or lottery or whatever is being sold at ten dollars. How much money are you expecting to lose by buying this? Ten minus six point eighteen, three dollars and eighty-two cents, 
right? Yeah. So th th that's how lotteries and raffles, they, that's how they work, right? So a few lucky people might get some money, but most people lose. And the person who made the lottery will, will be actually always winning, house always wins, right? And the, the average loss that you're gonna get will be like, you calculate the mean value and subtract that uh, from the lottery price and that's how much you're gonna lose. I once heard a joke like, uh, I wish there was a tax for stupid people. And uh, somebody said, oh, there, are, there already is. It's called the lottery, right? OK. Uh, right. OK. Uh, now, what you have just, just uh, seen is how we calculate the uh, average when there's a frequency table. So uh, see, x1, the first x1 we had was 0, and first f1 we had was 20, right? And uh, this formula says you multiply 0 to 20, and then the next one is 5, and that was repeat 10, so 5 times 10, and you keep adding them, right? So this, this is the numerator. Let's see, uh, this part right here is the numerator of this formula, right? And then you you uh, you have to divide it by thirty four. Okay, and that's how we got the mean. All right, now in the same way, instead of just adding xi separately many many times, you can just uh, save yourself some writing trouble by just multiplying by the frequency, right? So uh, here's something that we should all try to do. Rather than be scared about this formula, let's try to see how we can, uh, what, what the value of the variance is for the second case. All right, so, all right, so what is sigma squared? Okay, it would be helpful if you remember the frequency table. I do. Uh, okay, so let's see. First, uh, wh what was the first value? Zero, zero. zero, right? And then the mean value of the prize was? 6.18, right? And then you square that one. And you multiply it by how many raffle tickets were there with zero dollars? 20, right? Okay, good. And then the next value was five, right? Minus 6.18. And that has to be multiplied by 10. Okay, if you weren't paying attention, let me show you the, the table again. This is a table. Take a good look, okay? There are 20 tickets with zeros on it, 10 with 5 on it, and 3 with 20, and just 1 with 100, okay? So that's what we are calculating. And uh, while I'm writing this, please use your calculator to calculate this. Okay, and then the next value was, oh, then I forgot. Was the next one 20? I think it was, right? Yeah. 20 minus 6.18. And then there were three of them. And then the last one was uh, 100. Okay. And then times one there was only one and that's everything on the top now you divide this by 34 because there were a total of 34 right okay so that's the quantity did anyone get to calculate this no ah. all right i'll have to use my calculator just a minute. let me make that 
this bigger. No, not there. No, okay, good. Okay, so let me just do it over here. For me, this is easier than the calculator. Times 20 plus uh, 5 minus 6.18 squared times 10 plus uh, 20 minus 6.18 squared times just 3 plus 100 minus 6.18 squared times 1 and then divide this by 34. Okay, so that's the variance, 298.61. Or, or if you round it from there, we'll put 298.62. So let me write over here, 298.62. And then to get the sig sigma, the standard deviation, What would this be? How do you calculate that? Take the square root, right? So you take the square root of this quantity here. I'll just copy and paste. Seventeen point two eight. So that'll be seventeen point two eight. Okay. Uh, now, at this point, you might be a little puzzled at how to interpret this sigma. Is, does that mean it's a big value? What does that mean? Well, uh, let me do another example of frequency tables. Uh, and uh, after that, I will go back to this question. Okay, so the question that naturally arises after doing this calculation is that we did the standard deviation. Yes. Uh, the two nine. The question was, what does the two ninety eight mean? Well, two ninety eight point six two is the variance, and standard uh, seventeen point two eight is the standard deviation. And the natural question at this point is, what do these numbers mean, right? And uh, right now, I haven't given you how to read these data, okay? So that, that will be hard, part of today's lecture. So, so wait a little bit. I just do, want to do one more example in frequency tables, and then we're going to head over to understanding the standard deviation, right? Okay, so this is the fire department turnout time from lecture two. And the question is, how do we calculate mean from just this? Now, this is actually a very common occurrence like uh, you would f try to find up some data and uh, some government or company, they would post the data, but they wouldn't give you the raw data because uh, for one, uh, they want to like, keep some of this, the things private, like the, the raw data might have some personal information that's identifiable. So that could be a possible privacy issue, or sometimes it ha may have to do with the company trade secrets, so, so they don't want to show it either. So a lot of times what you're going to get is something like this, uh, a frequency table with uh, the range of values. So, uh, so in that case, because you don't have access to the raw data, the most you can do is just to find the mean value from what's given. Just make do with the best. Okay. And, and now here's the question. So I know that there's one guy who, at uh, one instance where uh, the turnout time was clocked between 30 to 39 seconds. Now, how do we calculate this in the mean? What value should we use? 30 through 39, what value should we use? Because we lack the information, we lack the raw data, the best we can use is what? You don't have any idea? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. Just just take the middle value, which is uh, you add the 30 and 39 and divide it by 2. Okay. And that will be used, right? The same thing here. 40 plus 49 divide by 2. And 50 plus 59 divide by 2. Uh, by the way, if you do that, you're going to get 54.9. No, no, 54.5. And then that value is going to be multiplied by this 7 because of the frequency table. All right? So that's the idea. In other words, we're using class midpoint. That's the correct terminology here. Class midpoint as a value and the frequency to approximate. Right. OK, so uh, just a quick calculation will yield like uh, the uh, the class midpoints to be like something 4.5. So uh, the, the class midpoint here, which is calculated by 30 plus 39 divided by 2 on your calculator. Uh, if you're not sure, just try to do that quickly on your calculator. You'll see that 30 plus 39 divided by 2 gives you 34.5. This will be 40, 44.5. This will be 54.5, 64.5, so on and so on. Okay. All right. And then... Uh, uh, I mean, hopefully the last example was enough to see how you do it by hand. But uh, since this is a lot more, let's use a calculator. So here's a TI-84 calculator. Quit. All right. So for this one, you, you first need to input all the data, right? But instead of the these values, we're going to put the class midpoints into the data. So here's what we're going to do. Put edit, and uh, this was my, my last data, but uh, let's just put in 34.5, enter, 44.5, enter, 54.5, enter, 64.5, enter, 74.5, enter, 84.5, enter, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, make sure that. We, we didn't lose anything. 94.5, enter. And there's no more, OK. So all the data class midpoints are entered. Now let's go to L2. Can, can you see this? Is, is it big enough? All right. So list 2, and what do I put? I put the frequency. I put 1, 1, 7, 2, 2, 2, 9, 8, 2. Put all that. Now I'm going to quit because I've entered all the data there. All right, we did something very similar last time. So let me see if you remember. What do we do? How do you get the mean value and st standard deviation? Stat, stat and calc. Yeah, just do the first one, one variable stats, enter. And now the only difference is uh, list is L1, but you also have the frequency list, right? So for, for the frequency list, you want to do uh, second stat, which lets you choose the list. Second plus stat lets you choose the list, and you go to number two, because L2 is where the frequency data is. And then you select enter, enter, and you get all the values, right? So uh, we know that the, the total is 70. And uh, the mean value is 70.07. .07, and uh, the standard deviation is 10.506. Okay. Now, uh, you see this capital SX and small sigma X, right? Capital SX is, is what we would use if we are interested in a, a bigger uh, bigger set of data, and what we have is just a sample. But uh, apparently, what we have here is all the data from within one year. So it's not a sample. Okay. So we're going to use a uh, small sigma x. Okay. All right. So the the values for for this would be seventy point zero seven and ten point five one. Oh, so with raw data. Oh, okay. So uh, average 70.07 .07, and standard deviation was 10 point, I forgot, 
10.51. Okay. Now let's compare with uh, the actual raw data. So in, in two lectures ago, in lecture two, we actually had our hands on the raw data and there the average was 70.3. And look, 70.3, 70.1, basically the same thing. They're very close, right? So you, you see that uh, using midpoints does give you a good idea of what the average should be. OK, so I just wanted to show you how to do this in the calculator. And you have to know how to use your calculator this way, because some questions on exam one and also maybe quiz this Wednesday yeah, might have you to do that. OK. All right. Uh, now let's come back to this idea about standard deviation. OK, so what does standard deviation tell us? That's that's like the the question that we want to address. And uh, there is a very famous rule called empirical 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Okay. 68, 95, 99.7 rule. And these are, these numbers are important enough that you have to memorize them. Okay. 68, 95, and 99.7 rule. And it says that if your data set is distributed like that, so if you draw the histogram of your data, let's say you found that the uh, this large data set had a bell-shaped curve. And here we're really talking about uh, the case where your data set is quite large, so that when you draw the histogram, it looks like a continuous function. And when you have this bell-shaped curve, then the empirical rule is that uh, people found out that 68% of the data would fit between plus one standard deviation to negative one standard deviation. And then 95% will fit between negative two standard deviation to positive two, two, two standard deviation. Or uh, another way to say is that we know that 95% percent of the data would be less than twice the standard deviation away from the mean. That's what it means. Okay. Now, uh, of course, uh, you can't expect all the data that you, you handle to have this bell-shaped curve, right? So you, you might immediately wonder, what's the use if this only applies to bell-shaped curves? And the answer is that uh, there are many, sorry, no, where was it here? Okay. There are many kinds of data that is actually bell-shaped. Uh, some examples are like, uh, height, adult height, adult adult male height, right? Of course, if you have like uh, two different population mixed together, it might be a little different. Uh, for example, you might have like different race, two two kinds of race mixed together. Then it might not be a bell shaped. It could have two peaks. But uh, if you have a homogeneous type of population. Uh, of only adult males, then you would expect the, the height to look like a bell-shaped thing. Birth weight is an example. IQ, uh, people's uh, IQ intelligence quotient scores, SAT scores, pulse rates, uh, blood platelet counts, uh, a lot of the things that, that you, you do test on on your uh, blood, blood work test, if you ever did any blood work in the lab? Uh, you get all these uh, different values about like uh, blood sugar and uh, or like cholesterol and stuff like that. These values they follow a bell curve, and uh, there there's a reason for that. And and one of the reasons why you would get a bell curve for so many examples uh, will be explained a little bit later when we do something called the binomial distribution. Okay, on the other hand, uh, 
if you think that there are a lot more data that's not bell-shaped, you're also correct. There, in fact, there are many kinds of data which deals with huge number of population and uh, the average and mean make uh, the average and median might make sense. But if you actually look at the data, uh, it's not bell-shaped. So uh, one example is the average household income. So if you look at the average household income, it's like uh, it's skewed, skewed to the right, meaning that uh, there's a lot of many people live in poverty. So uh, like there's a huge bump in the, in the beginning. And then a few people, they earn like uh, 100K, like 200K, a million a year or a billion a year. So it, it's, it extends to the right. So it's right skewed. Scores on the easy test. What do you think it will look like? A lot of people are going to get 90s and above, right? But some poor fellows who had no information that they were going to take a test this week might come to the exam unprepared and they might get like 30 or 50. But those will be rare, right? So most people will be close to the 90s if, if, uh, if the score, uh, if the test was pr pretty easy. And the uh, lifespan is left skewed. Uh, some unfortunate people die early. But uh, if you manage to live without any accidents, then you live to like pretty much like 80s, 90s. And so there's a peak there. But then afterwards, it's really hard to reach 100. So people die off really fast. So it's going to be left skewed. You know what left skewed means, right? You, you have to know these words, left skewed and right skewed, right? Okay. U.S. population age. Uh, it, yes. What's the left skewed? Okay. Okay, so I got a question. What's the left skewed? Okay. Uh, question. The problem is I don't have... Uh, I just realized you can't draw on this one. Oh, it does. Okay. All right. So let me let me say this again. So this. So if you have a have a leg that's extended this way, okay. A data set that looks like this. This will be left skewed. Okay. Oh, just a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So so what I was saying is that uh, a few people will die early because of like unfortunate medical or accidents or some medical problems or accidents will make them die early, right? But then if you don't die early, a lot of people reach up to 80s or 90s, but then after that, a few people will uh, live beyond that. So they, they, the, the graph falls off quickly. So you can see that the peak is like right here and then the foot is extended to the left. That's left, left skewed. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so... Uh... We're up to here. So back to the data. Uh, for the U.S. population data peaks, uh, the, the, for U.S. population age, so if you look at the population for each, each age, then you can see that the data peaks at 25 through 29 and five, 55 to 59. And I guess uh, 55 through 59 is what you call boomers, right? Mm -hmm. And then the boomers, they have kids and they, they now are aged 25 to 29. So, so you see those two bumps right there. Okay. okay. Uh, now, uh, knowing all this, let's try to answer the following question. Um, IQ score measures human intelligence and gives the score of 100 for average and scales it so that standard deviation is 15. That's the definition. So uh, when you get an IQ score of 115, uh, by the way, people think I have a high, high, very high IQ, but I only have 115. That was, I, I measured it when I was in high school. Uh, 
But what does that mean? 115 means you're just uh, one standard deviation higher than the mean. That's what it means because standard deviation is 15, right? Now, let's ask how many people have, not how many, what percentage of people have IQ between 70 to 130? What percentage? What percentage of people have IQ between 70 to 130? Well, Think about the difference between 130 and 100. What is it? 30. Now, how many standard deviation is that? Two. two. So 130 is two standard deviation higher than 100. How about 70? That's uh, two standard deviation lower than 100, right? OK. So that means you're looking at the, you're looking at between, so, so answer, this is between negative two standard deviation to uh, positive, positive two standard de deviation, which means, what percentage? Do you remember the numbers? 68 and then what? 95 and the 99.7, right? Which one is it? Which one is this one? It's the middle one, 95. So 95% of population is, uh, is here, uh, belongs here. And not surprisingly, I forgot what was the legal I think if it if your IQ is below seventy, then uh, you need some some like someone like a guardian or so. You can't legally represent yourself or something. Yeah. So that's that's like uh, so somebody who's less less IQ than seventy or more IQ than one hundred thirty will be like in the extremes, right? So uh, keep this in mind. Like two two standard deviation is a lot, right? Yes. Oh, okay, so someone asked me to explain this again. So uh, first, standard deviation is 15. So think of standard deviation right here as the value of, okay, so when, when you're given the standard deviation as 15, you should, Think of this as sigma being 15, right? Okay, then, uh, then you have to say 70 is uh, 70 minus 100 equals to negative 30 from the mean 100. Do you agree, right? So the difference is negative 30, right? But because standard deviation is 15, uh, this is negative two sigma from the mean. Yeah, you can just divide 30 by 15, you get two. So negative 30 divided by 15, you get negative two. So you know that it's negative two sigma from the mean. Right, yeah. So, uh, uh, doing the same for 130, we get that this is between negative two sigma to positive two sigma, which means 95% of the population belongs here. Is that good? All right. What was the question? No, just stay on the page for a oh, okay. So you're trying to write it. Okay. In the next slide, I have another similar question, and I'll give you some time to think for that one. Yes, you have a question? So when you 
you do the same for 130? Are you doing 130 minus 100? Yes, for 130, you do 130 minus 100. So you do the value minus the mean value. And you're dividing by the standard deviation. And that tells you how many standard deviation you, you're away from the mean. Yes, you have a question? Yeah, just, just to explain. So, like, so you're saying how like, that whole like, bell slope uh -huh. looks for like, negative 3, uh, whatever, I don't know the proper name. For yeah, so, so you're asking me to show this again. Okay, so bell curve. No, yeah, I understand that. But it's, so like you're just saying it's a way to figure out your percentile uh -huh. based on uh, doing like subtraction with the information you have. So like the way you got like negative 2, whatever that, the circle thing, and then you have positive plus 2. Right. So because we found out that it's between negative 2 times standard deviation to positive 2 standard deviation, we know that the 95% of the population fits between those two, according to this, this graph here. Okay. All right. So I want you to think, of, to think about this. Uh, so in Celsius, uh, by the way, uh, we don't know the reason, but uh, it's not just global warming. Uh, human body temperature is warming as well. Maybe it has something to do with, do with the global warming. I don't know. But, uh, so if you go back to the literature, uh, the body temperature maybe like 50, 60 years ago is lower. All right. But anyways, uh, let's just say that uh, in Celsius, human body temperature is 36.7 degrees Celsius, and the standard deviation is 0 0.4 degrees Celsius. And the first question is, what percentage of adults have body temperature between 35.9 degrees to 37.5 degrees? Think about this. Yes? Uh, so first of all, what you want to do is you want to do 35.9 minus 36.7. And you divide it by the how many standard deviation it has. So what you want to do is uh, do 35.9 minus 36.7, which gives you negative 0.8. Use your calculator to verify this. So what is this? Well, it's twice the 0 0.4, right? Yeah. So if you divide by 0 0.4, that's negative 2 sigma. On the other hand, try now uh, the other value, 37.5 minus 36.7. That gives you positive 0 0.8. And that gives you, just a minute, that gives you, uh, twice of 0 0.4 is so 2 sigma. Oh, so this is exactly what we had before, right? So answer. Yes? Divided by 0 0.4. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you want that as well. So divide by 0 0.4 to get negative 2. So divide by 0 0.4 to get positive 2. And because now it's between negative 2 sigma and positive 2 sigma, back to this picture here, between negative 2 sigma to positive 2 sigma, there's 95% of the population. Right? So the answer is 95%. OK, so this was very similar to the previous example. Now, here's something that's harder. So try, try this out. How did, how did you get a negative 2 for the? I took, OK, so the question was, how did I get negative 2? Well, I took this value, negative 0 0.8, divided by 0 0.4 on your calculator. You'll get negative 2. You didn't get it? You should get it. Negative 1. 
It's uh, 36.7. I think you said 36.5. That's different. And also, OK, so you're trying to do both in the calculator. OK, so here, here's another thing. Uh, some of you might just do all at once and try to do 35.9 minus 36.7 divided by 0.4. Now, what's wrong with doing this? You need a parenthesis, okay? That, that's a very common mistake, okay? So you can also just do this and get negative 2. Okay. No, doing all... I, 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 put the, uh, I was trying to divide 37.9. Uh, yeah. Subtract yeah. 37.5 from uh, 375. So if you get something else than what's on the screen, then uh, either you punched in the wrong numbers or you forgot a parenthesis, all right? Okay, so now try to think about the second part. What percentage of adults have... Body temperature between 36.7 to 37.1. Well, first of all, how many standard deviation is 36.7 away from the mean value? Zero. It's exactly the mean value, right? So that's zero standard deviation. It's right at the middle. OK. How about 37.1? How many standard deviation is that away from the 36.7? 0.4, which is how many standard deviation? One standard deviation. So this is uh, this is from zero standard deviation to one sigma. Uh oh, we didn't have anything like that, did we? Let's go back to the picture. So we know that from negative one sigma to positive one sigma is 68%. Well, we don't have anything for zero. Can you deduce it from this picture? What do you think? It should be 34. Why do you think so? Because we know that the bell curve is symmetric, and therefore you can just divide it by 2 to figure out that the right portion of that graph should just be 34%. Is that good? All right. So, so what we do here is uh, since negative one sigma to positive one sigma contains 68% and the bell curve is symmetric. We know that 34% of people fit here. Good? All right. Next, Chebyshev theorem. Okay. Now, then you would naturally wonder what you would do if your data is not a bell shaped curve. Uh, in that case, sometimes uh, what you might do is uh, uh, like you might just focus on the, the, the so if, if your data is like right skewed or left skewed, then you can throw away one of the tails and just look at some popula subpopulation, which is normal. Then, then you can still talk about the mean value and average and stuff like that. So that works sometimes. Uh, or just sometimes just getting rid of outliers can achieve the same thing as well. Uh, however, if nothing can be done, there's still some that there is still something that we can say using the standard deviation, and that's called the Chebyshev theorem. And it, it, it looks a little confusing, but here's the statement. The pop proportion of any set of data lying within k standard deviation of the mean is always at least 1 minus 1 over k squared. Now, I have a formula written down here, which may appear on your formula sheet, but you know, uh, what uses formula if you don't know how to use it or how to interpret it, right? But let's try to understand what it's really trying to say. If uh, for the, the probability or proportion of x's that belong between average minus k times standard deviation to average plus k times standard deviation is at least 1 minus 1 over k squared. And uh, it, 
one one thing that you notice here is that it just tells you the minimum. It doesn't tell you what value it is. That's a little disappointing. But on the other hand, all you know about the data is the mean value and the standard deviation. And you can still say something about the data. That's actually quite, mir uh, quite a miracle that su such a thing does work. So there, this is actually called Chebyshev inequality. Uh, but let me show you an example. So let's say at a highway with speed limit of 65 meter, miles per hour, uh, somebody measured and the mean value was 65 miles and standard deviation was four miles per hour. And using Chebyshev, at least what percentage of cars drive between 55 miles per hour to 75 miles per hour? Okay, so let's try to find the K value. So first thing is, can you figure out what 55 means with respect to se the, the median mean value 65, right? That's equal to negative 10. And now let's do the same thing as before. You, you divide this by the standard deviation, which is 4. And using your calculator, you're going to get negative 2.5. So that's the value of k. And meaning that 55 is 2.5 standard deviation less than the mean value, right? And then uh, you also have, uh, what else do you have? Uh, 75, 75 minus 65 divided by 4. That gives you positive 10 divided by 4, and that's 2.5. Yeah. Uh, by the way, this will be the negative k. And this will be the K. Okay, so you're basically saying that what percentage of the, the values from this data set belongs between negative 2.5 sigma to positive 2.5 sigma? So, right? So, so. And uh, we know that uh, by Chebyshev theorem, at least 1 minus 1 over what squared? 2.5 squared. OK. What is that? Uh, Hmm. I need a calculator. Or can somebody do this for me? What is one minus one, one divided by two point five? What did you get? Point what? Point a four. Okay. Uh, actually, 84, 0.84 equals to 84%. Okay, so we know that 84% of the data would be fitting between there. Okay, and that's because we don't know if the the data set would be uh, bell shaped. Okay, it sounds like it should be bell shaped, but uh, maybe it's not. So, in that case, uh, you can guarantee that at least 84% of the cars fit between these two. Okay. Now let's uh, talk about units of mean, median, and variance. Uh, so for a height of US males measured in inches, by the way, th this part is not so important, so you don't have to take notes. Uh, so units of mean, median, variance, and standard deviation. If the data set is in inches. The mean and median will be in inches, right? And how about the variance? That's uh, you're squaring something, which are in inches. So you get what? Square inches, right? And how about standard deviation? You take the square root of the variance, so you get inches again, 
right? Good. Uh, if you have the data of car speeds, your mean and median will be in miles per hour, right? How about variance? It will be miles squared per hour squared because you're squaring it, okay? And then you take the square root, you get the standard deviation. Now, uh, often we like to have dimensionless quantities. Uh, so there are two things, uh, coefficient of variation and the z-score. The coefficient of variation divides the standard deviation by the mu, and uh, that cancels the, the, the units, and you get a dimensionless quantity. Uh, it, basically, it has no unit, right? And the reason that you want to uh, have these dimensionless quantity is to see if something is more widely spread or not. So uh, one example in the textbook, it, it compares like the uh, strength of Verizon wireless signal with uh, the uh, earthquake in intensity and shows that by comparing the two coefficient of variation, uh, it shows that the, the Verizon wireless signal has more variation than the earthquake or something like that. Okay. Uh, that's less important, but what's really important is this z-score. So uh, up to here, I don't want you to write any notes, but this is actually important. Okay. Actually, just this, this formula right here. This, you should write this one. Okay. So what's a z-score? Z-score is exactly the, the, word, the calculations that we've, we have done. What did we do? We did value minus the mean and you, we divide it by the standard deviation, right? Okay. And if, if you do that, we can figure out how many standard deviation this data is away from the mean. Okay. Now, if the z-score is two, is that large? If z-score is two, is that large? Yeah, it's two standard deviation away. That's like, we know that 95% of the data fits between negative two standard deviation to positive two standard deviation, right? Yes? So is standard deviation always like negative three up to negative, up to positive four? I mean, negative three up to positive four? The question was, is standard deviation always like negative three to positive three? Uh, no, uh, so I have the graph written as negative three times the standard deviation. Uh, if you have a bell curve, like if you draw up to a negative three sigma to positive three sigma, you get virtually almost the entire thing. Yeah, that's called six sigma. Okay, six sigma contains 99.7% of the data. Okay, it's just the way we present things. That's not nothing that you should, you should uh, uh, worry about. Okay, all right. So we, we say if a z-score has two or negative two, or if it's higher number than that, then we say, it's very unusual. So if you have an IQ of 140, that's like what? Uh, more than twice the standard deviation. So z-score will be bigger than two, it'll be like 2.67. That's a very high IQ, all right? So that's how we can think of it. And let me just uh, finish with this one. Uh, so let's say you you have, you just got the flu, flu shot or COVID vaccine and your temperature is 99.7. Is that higher than usual? You might ask, right? And you just take the z-score, which is this minus 98.3, which is uh, 1.4 divided by 0.64. Is that right? 1.6 divided by 0.64. And this does give you more than two sigma. So yes, it is more, uh, the z-score is higher than two. Okay. That's everything for today. Thank you.